Hello, this is your good friend Kalatz. Today, <laughs> traditional Moroccan jellaba and the little hats, you know? So I look very sweet today, you know? <laughs> okay, today we'll be talking about... Uh, <laughs> we're talking about the... Uh, the ways that they, they, that they use the religion to convey indigeneity and then the problems with this. And about the religious history of Palestine. Because it's a subject I'm interested in, personally, very deeply, uh, given my life, you know. <laughs> okay. So, I think it's very common for the Zionists to use the fact that Judaism should be considered a uniquely, uh, I guess say Palestinian, for lack of a better word, religion. It's, 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 you know, a uniquely close ties to the land of Canaan. And this, I don't even think they believe it, honestly. Because this is, this is a tool, a rhetorical tool for ignorant Christians who really have no experience of the history of Canaan other than from the Bible. But for Jewish people, the Bible isn't really super, super important, usually. Depends. <laughs> Some sects, they, they swear by it, but the Bible comes before Judaism. You'll notice that the word Jew, at least in the Old Testament, is never mentioned or hardly ever mentioned because there were no Jews. Judaism came out of the Bible uh, rather than Jews writing the Bible. But they weren't the only religion that comes out of the Bible, of course. We have the Bible of uh, the Samaritans, which is nearly identical with a few theological slash political differences around the location of what is the important temple. The Samaritans, they say the important place for the temple is Gerizim because that actually was the big center of Israelite religion, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the center of the Judites, who were the ancestors of the Jews, along with some Sumerian mix-ins after the conquest of the Israelites by the Assyrians, which is a historical event. It's a historical event that was attested in multiple uh, primary sources that the Assyrians conquered the kingdom of Israel, which was a Samaritan kingdom, you know, not a Jewish kingdom. And that some of the refugees came, pres no, no, this is, this is less like based on primary sources, but based on secondary sources, secondary sources, analysis of the primary source, that refugees and exiles from the kingdom of Israel go south into Judah and they homogenized their mythical stories with the native Judahite mythical stories, which is why you get a lot of contradictions in the Bible. And you get like, you have chronicles and kings that purportedly cover the same history, but contradictorily with different biases. They, they also reference like different historical sources because the Bible is not one document. There's no one document, the Bible, the Bible is the, the word of God. No, no reasonable person believes this, although there are plenty of unreasonable people who do. <laughs> it's a, a series of mythical, historical, and ambiguously between these two sort of texts that were preserved from the ancient Near East and wisdom literature. So you, you see the same thing in the context of Mesopotamia and Egypt. You find mythic literature and historical literature, let's say, or historomythic literature, like with Gilgamesh, where you have historical-ish figures like Gilgamesh and Merkar, Zisudra, interacting with gods, which we consider mythological. The same thing with the Bible. And we have wisdom literature from the Akkadians, so the, Ak the Akkadian's father's advice to his son, which mirrors like proverbs and other biblical texts of, of advice, essentially, and, and commandments, um, and similar texts in Egypt with the papyrus of Ani and the maxims of Ptahotep, which are moral instructions. 
The Egyptians, of course, are often demonized in uh, popular depictions. And, in fact, rightfully so, because they were an imperial power. They were very brutal. But they also had a very strong indigenous moral philosophical tradition, which is very foundational to what one might call the Western moral philosophical tradition, in that it preempted both, you know, the quote-unquote Judeo-Christian values in Egypt and uh, also the, the Hellenistic values. So the Greeks understood that they learned morality from Easterners, from Egypt and from the Levant and from Mesopotamia. They knew that. That's what Pythagoras was doing. He was, he was uh, doing his gap year uh, studying philosophy in, in the Near East. And he brought it back to Greece along with weird cult ideas about not eating beans. <laughs> but <laughs> it's history. It has to be goofy a little bit. Not everything is just, oh, and then they learn to work along in harmony. No, it's supposed to be like, beans, they make you lose your soul because you farted out, you know. <laughs> I didn't know my soul was so so smelly. Anyway, <laughs> it's back to the topic at hand. Indigeneity of religion in Palestine. Well, even in the Jewish mythical texts, the Bible, the biblical texts, Genesis, Exodus, these, they don't have their roots in Palestine. It's the, the Jewish people, as is understood through, you know, genealogy, traces its back to the patrimony of Abraham. So Abraham is the quote unquote, the father of the Jewish people, although he's also the father of other peoples, because, you know, his son, for his son Isaac, um, who is the ancestor of Jews, and also the through through Jacob and Esau, he's the, the ancestor, I believe, of the Moabites, who are the close closest to the Israelites in terms of, so so so. Jacob is Israel. Israel come from Jacob, you know? Okay. So, <laughs> and in their mythology, Abraham, where is he from? He's not from Palestine, you know? He's from they call Ur of the Chaldees, but that's an ambiguous location. It could be all sorts of things. The initial one is people think, oh yeah, it's Ur in Sumer. I think the more modern interpretation is that it's Urkesh in northern Syria, like around in the vicinity of Kharkiv, near the, the borders between Syria, Iraq, and uh, Turkey in that, that region, what we call maybe Kurdistan or the Jazeera, which would give uh, Abraham a more Hurrian origin and is also in line with some of the archaeological texts of names that have similar phonetic value to Abraham. For example, the vizier Ibrium of Ebla, who's from northern Syria. And there's a Hurrian connection. And of course, the Hurrians are the most overlooked people in ancient history because they invented so much of what we think of as ancient mythology, music, all these things, these come from the Hurrians. So they're like, uh, you know, you watch Citizen Kane, and like, why is this movie so popular? It's just really average, just a normal movie. But Citizen Kane invented the normal movie. <laughs> Hurrians invented the normal mythology, the mythology that we understand from the Greeks and, and the Romans and, and, and all these cultures. These come from the Hurrians, the, the, the fighting with heroes and monsters. This comes from Hurrians in Eastern Anatolia. And it seems very plausible that Hurrians are also connected in some way to the story of Abraham Maybe Ibrium Huga. I think I, I I put very little stock in what Christians and Jews write about Ebla, but whatever they do get their 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 funding checks signed, you know they have to make up. Oh, this is related to the Bible here, here, and here, so they can keep getting you know donations from Christian billionaires. Otherwise, their research in Syria won't get done, which is would, would be a huge pity, because the best archaeological finds of the past century, I think a lot of them in Syria. So on their own merits, irrespective of this biblical stuff, which is 
I'm not gonna say it's nonsense, but it's kind of like a rabbit hole that just keeps going and really doesn't yield any good fruit, you know? Okay, so we're talking about this. And then they say, that, okay, well, he goes, he goes to Palestine, but he doesn't live in Palestine very long. He just sort of hangs out and migrates around. It's just his family. There are already other people there. There's already plenty of Canaanites, Amorites, Hivites, which is the Hebrew word, actually, for uh, Hurrians, and Hittites already in this land. So they end up going to Egypt because of a famine. And on a personal level, this is a family, one family, one family, one family in a land already populated with cities, agriculturalists, and other nomads. So, so that's a pretty big, a big red flag, I guess, for the indigenous Israelite sort of story. Then they go and spend several hundred years sojourning in Egypt. Is this historical? Is there, is there a period of slavery of Hebrews in Egypt? It's ambiguous. <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to go say 100% no, there's no... no Israelite slavery in Egypt, nor am I going to say 100% there is the biblical account. Because the biblical account is wrong, factually, or at least based on what we know of archaeology. But we do know there was a significant Semitic and Canaanite presence in Egypt, in the Delta particularly, especially around Avaris, which is the big trading center in the Delta. And we also know that the Egyptians were mass practitioners of slavery. They didn't use slavery to build the pyramids. That was skilled labor That was and corvée labor, which was actually fairly well paid by the standards of the time. Mostly when the Egyptians used slavery, it was for two purposes, or two or three purposes, which are the same as other civilizations in antiquity. One, simple agricultural slaves. That was how most Canaanite slaves in Egypt lived. They were agricultural slaves working on the estates of Egyptian landlords slash nobility. Just the same as you find in Greece or in Rome. And they were naturally put in economic competition with the free peasants because, <laughs> you know, the landlords love to turn their little underlings against each other the ones they don't have to pay and the ones that they do but of course they had to feed their slaves so sometimes it was better to have peasants than slaves which is why slavery was never super heavily practiced in egypt compared to in rome because there was just such a large population of native egyptians who had very low status for you know just by being peasants the second category of slaves and this is the worst type of slavery in antiquity which was as worse if, you know, as, as the slavery we see in the Americas, which is mining slavery. And this is the slavery of you are just digging in the ground in these shafts or whatever in the hot sun, in, in any climate. And they don't worry if you live or die because you make them money. They don't try to preserve your life, which is why mining slavery is the worst kind of slavery. It's kind of like a proletarian slavery, actually. And then the third type of slavery is what, uh, <laughs> well, Malcolm X would have referred to as the house Negro, but they didn't have the house Canaanite. They would be skilled slaves, like maids and barbers, because Egyptians needed barbers. They would always shave off all their beard and their hair. Modern day Egyptians are very hairy. The ancestors were no different, but they had to shave because they wanted to keep their skin clean and clear to prevent like parasites like lice from growing in their hair, which was very, very, it's a cultural thing, but also an adaptational thing. Ancient Egyptians shaved and if you were wealthy, a wealthy Egyptian, you would hire, you wouldn't hire, you would own slaves and they would shave you. There are other skilled slave professions, of course, like there were slave magicians and slave incantations and all, because the Egyptians had this kind of mystique around Canaanites much in the same way, I believe, that in colonial America, there was this still exoticism and mystique about recently transported African slaves. It wasn't, you know, a thought of equality, but they recognized that there were some qualities that their Canaanite slaves had that were desirable and wanted 
and there were higher status slaves and lower status slaves. And this, this was the nature. And you kind of also, there was this period where the Canaanites kind of took over the north with uh, the 13th dynasty, the 13th or 14th? The 13th or 14th dynasty, I think it's the 14th dynasty of Egypt that was a local dynasty, but it was a Canaanite local dynasty. So there were also free Canaanites in the Delta. And one of their early kings was named Yakbim. <laughs> and of course, you know, the biblical literal say, oh, that sounds a lot like Jacob or, or maybe he's Joseph or somehow related to that. I'm like, mm, tenuous. But it's obviously a Semitic name in an Egyptian context as a pharaoh. So he's a Semitic Canaanite pharaoh. And I would say probably by population, more than half of ethnic Canaanites at that time probably lived in Egypt um, by virtue of the fact that it's just a better, more fertile land than Canaan. Canaan has always been kind of, I mean, it's not a desert, but it's, it's unstable. Weather patterns uh, make it unstable to have consistent living. And we see like cycles of drought and flood and this is reflected in the mythology and history of the region. So you would often have people leaving for Egypt, the Egyptian Delta, which is this beautifully fertile region with, you know, you can you, you plant a seed in the ground, you have a mango tomorrow, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an exaggeration, but it, it's one of the most fertile regions on the planet. It's the, it's the Nile Delta, although there's lots of mosquitoes and other nasties in the water ready to catch you. But if you're starving, you're willing to brave the nasties. And they also say, you know, it's, it's a fact that a lot of what makes up the identity of Judaism, even in the Jewish mythology, comes from Egypt. Monotheism. Monotheism originates in Egypt with the, the monotheism of Aten. The Achanan, he, he is not the progenitor of the Aten cult, actually. His forebearers had provided support for this Aten cult which was a more naturalistic and scientific, let's say, cult, I guess, because they're worshiping the visible face of the sun rather than an anthropomorphized Amun-Ra. But of course, these coexisted in the 18th dynasty. Egypt was never a homogenous country in, in antiquity about its religious practices. They had a variety of contradictory practices and myths and beliefs in each of the different cities in Egypt because Egypt was so diverse. There's the Nubian-influenced Egyptians in the Thebaid in the south, and there's the Canaanite-influenced Egyptians in the north, and the Libyan-influenced Egyptians in Lake Moriotis. And then we also had their own traditions around Sobek, the, uh, you know, the crocodile god, and there's all these traditions. And then the central one with Ta and his wank juice creating the universe <laughs> oh man we're getting really dirty and down dirty with this but this is a big influence so the moral influence and the theological mythological influence of egypt on what we think of as the bible is very apparent and that's not in palestine either that's not canaanite of course it's bleeding over into the canaanites without a doubt they are part and parcel of this mesopotamian Hurrian and Egyptian traditions all getting mixed together. And of course, most of this was actually happening. Like, the big mixture was happening in Syria, Palestine. The Palestine region was kind of like a backwater of the Levant in antiquity. It had a few major cities, of course, the biggest one being Hazor and the biggest military being Shechem, as is reflected in even the biblical sources and with archaeology. But it was never on the same level as what was going on in Syria. So, in the biblical mythology, only after, you know, hundreds of years in Egypt and their formative, you know, then they go to Palestine and then Canaan. And they have to exterminate the local people, according to the myth. This is exaggerated, of course. In any, any sense, there may have been, like, former slaves coming from Egypt and Arab tribes, like the Midians, are almost unambiguously Arab, mixing together with the Shasu, <laughs> you know, and creating this milieu that fills in 